Well, good afternoon and welcome once again to the fortnightly broadcast from the Committee for Workers International and CWI Media. And of course, since our last broadcast, we've seen dramatic changes in the international situation. The global crisis has undoubtedly intensified. We've seen the turmoil in the US presidential elections taking place, the demise of Trump's support. We'll see how that uh, situation develops. But of course, here back in Europe, we've also seen dramatic changes in the situation. We've seen in most countries, almost all countries now, a dramatic rise in the infection rate, which has gone up. We've seen the introduction of lockdowns or partial lockdowns in a series of countries. And I think it's also true to, see, to say that we've seen an incredible increase in class polarization, which has swept uh, uh, through the continents. It's reflected here in the UK with this incredible clash which is uh, broken out between uh, uh, Manchester uh, and the government over the question of uh, uh, the non-allocation of funds to support them when they've gone for a tier two lockdown. We've seen in Spain, for the first time in a European country, more than one million people have been infected by the coronavirus. And here today, we're going to explore some of these issues, the question of the infection rate, the health rate, what is happening economically, the increased repressive measures which have been introduced, the increasing tendency towards lockdown, what that means and what the response of working people to those uh, developments has been in Europe. And we're joined today by three activists and leading comrades from their respective organisations, members of the Committee of the Workers International. First of all, Virginie from France, from Gauche Revolutionnaire. So a warm welcome to Virginie. Michael from Hi. Seoul in uh, Berlin, in Germany, and Rob uh, here in London from uh, the Socialist Party in England and Wales. And as per usual, we'd encourage our viewers, if they'd like to uh, read more of our analysis, go to our webpage on socialistworld.net, go to our CWI media channel on YouTube and subscribe if possible. But without further ado, let's get into the meat of the discussion and explore what is taking place in some of the key countries of Europe at this stage. So maybe we could uh, go to France uh, to start our discussion uh, today, uh, uh, to Virginie, because here we've seen, of course, a whole series of developments uh, which have taken place. We've seen Macron's introducing a curfew. There's been all sorts of attacks by the Macron government against working class people in, uh, in general. Uh, we've seen an intensification of the, uh, of the economic crisis uh, in France and the resurgence of the virus as well. So maybe, Virginie, you could start the discussion by outlining what the current situation is in France. How is Macron now seen? You know, he's increased his role internationally, uh, intervening in a whole series of international disputes. But what's his situation domestically? And how is the French working class uh, faring economically? against the background of this intensifying crisis. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, we, we, we have a difficult situation here in France uh, in terms of, as you said, uh, the, 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 the epidemic, but also uh, in terms of economic crisis and also political crisis, and lately as uh, you all have heard, I guess, um, a terrorist attack and the murder of a, a teacher. Um, all this situation is extremely tense um, because of the repressive measures, because of the tension of the, uh, of the economic situation, the job market, and all the uh, political polarization. So Macron is uh, really down, has gone really down in the polls. Uh, there is a, a large layer of people who are really angry. Um, uh, and the youth also is really angry at uh, these policies. Uh, people are angry because the government has failed and is still failing to, um, uh, to manage uh, the epidemic, uh, everything that was promised uh, to the hospitals and uh, 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 hosp uh, health workers uh, has been forgotten. I mean, nothing has been done. 
and all the measures that have been put in place um, are useless uh, to fight against the epidemic. Uh, the curfew, uh, according to a large layer of scientists, uh, uh, doctors, etc., won't be enough to uh, slow down the uh, epidemics. Uh, and basically what workers are thinking is that the only thing we are allowed to do is to go and work. Uh, you're allowed to go and work and go back home and that's it really. And that's really creating uh, anger and tensions. Uh, the only thing that this government really did uh, is to vote for a, a stimulus package for uh, the big buses, the big uh, companies. So it's a hundred billion uh, in, I mean, a hundred billion just given uh, for uh, in reduction of taxes and things like that. Uh, given to the to the big companies, and really uh, a few uh, a few yeah a few hundreds of euros uh, for uh, workers who've lost their jobs, uh, who considering that now poverty is really getting um, uh, high is really spreading. Uh, so here is the choice of the government. Uh, against the epidemic and against the uh, economic crisis. Um, the unemployment rate, as everywhere, is going up and uh, there is no uh, perspective for it to, to slow down, uh, considering that uh, the government's plans uh, doesn't ask the, the companies to, uh, doesn't forbid companies to uh, stop redundancies. So we've had uh, a lot of redundancies and there will be more. A uh, hundred, uh, for the moment, uh, 600,000 uh, jobs have been lost since March and the lockdown. And it's estimated that this, num this figure will go up to a million. So probably one million jobs will have been lost uh, uh, by the end of uh, the year. And there is no optimistic prospect for uh, a better, I mean, an economic recovery uh, soon. So uh, as the government is uh, making its propaganda to say, okay, every, we're, we're all in this together, you know, that <laughs> they already did that in March, a bit of everywhere. So we all in it together, but workers have uh, to suffer more from it than, uh, uh, than the bourgeoisie and the capitalists. Um, so they pretend that their plan will help creating uh, over 600,000 jobs. Nobody believes that, I mean, no economists. Uh, has, I um, uh, said that it could be the case. It probably won't be the case. And with the curfew and more uh, restrictive measures, it means that there are less tourists, uh, restaurants, uh, bars, theaters, cinemas, etc. All the cultural sector is going to, to close. All the touristic sector uh, is going to be impacted. And uh, there, there is uh, little chance uh, that uh, this uh, stimulus package will have any effect at all, uh, as the previous stimulus packages didn't have any effect anyway on uh, jobs and uh, workers' uh, financial situation. Uh, so it's a, it's a failure. And what the government is doing to divert attention from its political failure and economic failure, and uh, the failure also with the economy, with the epidemic, uh, is that Macron is uh, bragging uh, around everywhere in the world, uh, trying to uh, to appear as the savior in in Lebanon, for example, uh, 
And at the same time, in France, they are really whipping up racism, really using, um, uh, I mean, the government is really going to the right and uh, using the same arguments, the same uh, propaganda as the far right, really. Uh, and with the uh, terrorist attack that happened last uh, uh, that happened last uh, Friday night, uh, they're really using it in a very opportunistic way uh, to divert attention from their own uh, policy. Maybe I. Yeah. No. Well, that, that, I mean, you've made some very important points there, version I mean, obviously, it's quite clear from what you say that Macron's. Uh, policies economically are going to resolve absolutely nothing. You have the prospect of a million uh, jobs being lost by the end of the year. And then, of course, factored into that is the curfew, the repression. And now you've had this horrific uh, terror attack with the killing of the teacher. Now, you mentioned there the issue of the growth of racism, how the government is uh, whipping up uh, racism. Uh, what's been the response of French workers, French young people towards this situation? And has Le Pen and the far right been able to use that, or is the government, by shifting to the right and adopting a sort of more racist uh, approach, has that stolen some of the march of the uh, far right, or is the far right still able to capitalise on the situation? Um, yeah, so uh, as you said, I'm a teacher, and uh, obviously uh, we're, we've been all uh, horrified at uh, what happened. Um, and the 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 re people's reaction really is shock. The, the the first reaction was really shock that such an awful act could happen in front of a school, especially in front of a school, uh, is really shocking. Uh, but people are also really shocked uh, by the way uh, uh, politics or politicians are using uh, this, uh, this, uh, this horror. Um, when I, I was saying that the government is whipping up racism, just give you an example. Uh, yesterday, the Minister of the Interior uh, was interviewed on TV, and he, he said that he was a bit shocked at seeing all the, these communit communitarists uh, uh, communitarist food in supermarkets and obviously he wasn't thinking about uh, sushis and faritas or burritos he was thinking about halal food or kasher food uh, and I mean what what's the message behind that when uh, few, uh, the day before you you've decided to close down the mosque and the day before you said that you're going to ex expel 250 people uh, who are accused of being uh, uh, fundamentalists. And the day before that, uh, you said that uh, so the, the, prime, the minister, the interior minister, uh, said that there will be uh, police uh, going down in people's home uh, and not people who, just to pass a message. What he said is that the police is going to hand down the fundamentalist and it might uh, break into homes of people who are not really directly re related to the attack, but might be. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means that the Muslim in France are targeted uh, not just by the far right, but by the government itself. Um, and this is really outrageous. There is a sheer hypocrisy uh, in, uh, on all the political spectrum, really, from the uh, 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 former Social Democrats, the, the Parti Socialist, up to uh, Marine Le Pen and the far right. Uh, they're pretending to uh, to support the teachers, they're pretending uh, to defend uh, the liberty, uh, uh, freedom, fraternity and equality, which is the motto of uh, the French Republic. Um, but this is sheer hypocrisy uh, because 
there is no liberty. It's that government is attacking freedom right now. Uh, that government uh, and uh, is uh, making uh, policies which are uh, which are unequal. Uh, it is an unequal uh, republic we are living in, and there is no fraternity. Um, on the part of the government when when they are trying to divide people uh, as they are doing. Um, so in France, we've been living under a state, I mean, official state of emergency since 2015. Okay, we've been living under that state of emergency since 2015. And at that time, it wasn't the right on uh, in power. Uh, it was the Parti Socialiste, it was the Social Democrats. Um, and it hasn't stopped and it's not going to stop now. So uh, state of emergency and uh, curfew and uh, financing wars, imperialist wars uh, everywhere in the Middle East, uh, supporting dictatorships everywhere uh, in the world plus uh, a new set of uh, racist laws that are going to be discussed in Parliament in the next uh, period, uh, a, a set of laws that are called against separatism, uh, in which only Islam is mentioned uh, as a religion and the rest is, uh, I mean, and that's it. Um, there is a rise of police brutality, and anti-Muslim uh, propaganda. And on the other hand, you have more money for the richest. So all this, uh, to that situation now of, of all these politicians is really hypocritical to the, uh, to the last level. Um, they're all saying that they're defending freedom of speech uh, because the teacher who was uh, beheaded uh, was so supposedly because he showed uh, caricatures of Mohammed in class in a in a debate in class about the freedom of speech. So all the politicians are using this to say, uh, as they already did in 2015 when the satirical journal. Uh, the satirical paper Charlie Hebdo was attacked, was bombed. Uh, so they're using the same rhetoric, or we are for the freedom of, of speech. But uh, Macron's rule has been the most repressive rule uh, we've seen uh, in years, even worse than Sarkozy, who was already hated uh, for that. Um, there is a rise of repression and uh, the re this repression doesn't touch anyone. It, it touches those who are against this government, those who are trying to organize against this government. The Yellow Vest movement was uh, bloodily repressed. Uh, all the um, uh, teachers were repressed also. Um, and union activists are targeted directly, uh, have been targeted directly in, this, in the last year. And it's going, uh, I mean, it's getting uh, worse and worse. Um, and just to finish, but this hypocrisy when they say they support teacher, teachers uh, is also horrific when you see how underfunded is uh, the education system in France, uh, how uh, casualized the workers in the education uh, are, how overcrowded our classes are. And uh, the last um, so-called reforms, counter-reforms of this government on education uh, are made to open uh, the education uh, system to the edtech and uh, open uh, education to the, to the private market. Um, so um, the consequences of such a politic, of such policies, uh, can only bring more and more violence and more intolerance. And we've seen the first uh, result, the first dramatic consequences of that when uh, last, Saturday, last Sunday, two women were stabbed, two Muslim women were stabbed 
in the in the neighbor uh, around the the Eiffel Tower in Paris. They were stabbed and called dirty Arabs and go back to your country. Uh, that's why they were stabbed just the day after uh, Macron said we'll uh, target Muslims, etc. So that's what the mood is. And just to finish on what we're saying at the moment is that obviously we reject uh, extremely vividly uh, terror and terrorist attacks and uh, the violence that is uh, unleashed on uh, normal people, on, uh, on normal work, work, on ordinary workers by uh, uh, obscurantists and uh, uh, fundamentalists. We definitely reject that. But on the, the other hand, uh, we are on the side of the workers. We are on, on the side of the workers. So we also reject uh, all the racist, vicious racist attacks that and propaganda that um, workers are suffering for because we know that Macron is not on the side of workers, whether they are Muslim, Jewish or whatever. Uh, and in the end, uh, the workers are the only one who can defend their own uh, interests. And the workers are those who initially fought for the freedom of conscience, fought for the freedom of speech. We're the one who uh, imposed it on the bourgeoisie, on the capitalists. And if we were to wait on them, we wouldn't have any freedom of speech. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, that. <laughs> all, it's obviously an extremely difficult situation. I mean, it's incredible to think France has been under a state of, uh, of, of, of emergency since, t since 2015. And as you say, that was brought in by the Socialist Party uh, mm. uh, government and regime. But that begs the question. It's obviously a very difficult situation, quite explosive, and presumably, I think, quite polarised the position. It could open up and of course a backlash can develop but what is the alternative from the left you mentioned the socialist party uh and we, that that's role is clear in terms of what the role of the socialist party has been in terms of propping up the system but you have of course another left force in france as well mm. uh, france is on me uh, led by Mélenchon. what are they doing what's their response to the current situation and what is gosh revolutionaire advocating in relation to what uh, France and Sony should do uh, to face up to this crisis? Um, yeah, the, the left is uh, is also extremely polarized, and it's been. Um, I mean, Mélenchon uh, has um, a great support uh, from workers, and is um, the polls. I mean, it's. The, the, the presidential election will take place on in two years, so you have to be careful with the polls, of course. But uh, in any situation, is uh, the best uh, placed uh, uh, in uh, opinion polls. Is the most recognized uh, leader on the left, uh, definitely. Uh, and now in that situation, so the Fr France Insoumise, so the movement. Uh, Mélenchon is leading, uh, has a, uh, has an approach uh, which doesn't help <laughs> in a way as uh, they've always been advocating for uh, a sixth republic. So today in France is the fifth republic of French history. Uh, so Mélenchon is ad advocating for a change of republic. The thing is that the republic they're uh, calling for has no class uh, basis. Uh, they're calling for a republic, but they're not saying a workers' republic, as if the sh the what matters is just uh, the organization of society and not the uh, class division of society and who owns uh, really uh, the uh, the the economy. Uh, and after, uh, I mean, since Saturday, 
and the terrorist attack, they've been um, advocating for uh, national unity and even saying they would be willing to vote some of the measures proposed by the government in their so-called separatist, anti-separatist law. Uh, uh, for example, they say that they, the government should, uh, there is a need to reinforce police forces and intelligence forces against terrorism and things like that, uh, which doesn't point uh, to uh, the right enemy and doesn't point to the real way in which um, workers to uh, workers could uh, put an end to uh, that terror and put an end to uh, the exploitation they're, they're uh, suffering for from. Um, and um, so it's, it's obviously things are going on right now. So uh, we'll need to see in the next uh, days how the, the activists, the members of uh, France Insoumise will react to that. Um, uh, but on the left, there is either that kind of uh, approach or uh, on the other hand, on, on the other end, uh, far left parties who refused, for example, to call for the march uh, uh, that was organized Saturday in um, uh, Sunday, sorry, the march that was organized Sunday uh, in uh, to pay tribute to uh, Samuel Paty, the teacher who was uh, who, who was uh, killed. Uh, so the far left said, okay, we refuse, uh, as we refuse national unity, we're not going to participate in that, uh, in that march, which means that you let workers alone with the uh, uh, far right and the government's propaganda, and you have nothing to uh, propose in between. So we were there on Gauche Révolutionnaire, and uh, we had a warm uh, welcome from people. We, we could discuss uh, uh, our political program and the fact that uh, we should be united against racism and united against Macron and uh, Le Pen and, and the like, uh, because they defend the same system in the end. What's going on is that as Macron is going further to the right, the far right is going further to the right. Uh, and I guess that Macron expects to uh, to uh, like uh, to to gain some uh, voters from the far right, uh, but he could be uh, beaten in that uh, dangerous uh, in that dangerous fight. So I think that strategy it's a conscious strategy from Macron, uh, but it's a dangerous one because in the end uh, the far right could win uh, could win that uh, that battle on the left. What we argue, uh, what we argue for, uh, for gauche révolutionnaire, and we've been arguing for that for quite a long time now, is uh, to have a united uh, front against racism and against capitalism, to have a united resistance against uh, racism and um, and capitalism, um, and what, uh, yeah, and. What we explain also is that uh, to defend the uh, freedom of speech, to defend the, uh, uh, the freedom to believe or not to believe, uh, it's workers who have an interest in that. It's workers who have an interest in being in unity, really. Uh, and that workers need to, to gather uh, in their and build their own party. Uh, that's what we're discussing also within the France Insoumise in which we are part of. Uh, that that party needs to be a fighting workers' party because the workers are the only class uh, who is really who has the means to um, uh, to fight capitalism and to build a society where. Uh, all the basic needs will be fulfilled, where uh, uh, there will be a real, a, a 
basis, uh, economic, social basis for equality and fraternity and tolerance. And that these, uh, uh, these words uh, shouldn't be only be words, that fraternity, tolerance, freedom uh, need to have a, a, a concrete basis. Uh, and that lies in uh, economic equality. So fighting for a socialist society is the answer uh, we have uh, to dis that we're discussing right now with more and more workers and youth who reject both racism and uh, capitalism. Uh, no, thanks, Virginie. I mean, it's obviously an extremely difficult position. You paint a picture there that's echoed internationally, as maybe we'll explore in relation to uh, Germany and Britain, of how some of the so called left are playing into this, uh, this uh, song, or singing the song of national unity and uh, capitulating to many of the proposals of the government. Now, that's the crisis situation in relation to France. Now, if maybe we could turn to Germany, where we've had, of course, a somewhat different situation. Uh, Merkel has been somewhat strengthened in her support during the course of that, because Germany allegedly has managed this uh, crisis somewhat better, uh, certainly than what uh, Johnson has managed to do here in the UK. But nevertheless, maybe Michael could outline what is the current situation in Germany. We've had quite a dramatic rise of infections now taking uh, place. More restrictions have been introduced uh, mm -hmm. in different parts of the country. So what is the current situation in Germany for government infections? Uh, and how is the SOL, SOL responding to that? Well, uh, thanks, Tony, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I mean, obviously, we also want to prevent a lockdown here, but we want to do it for completely different reasons than uh, the Merkel government uh, would do it. Because we would like to prevent a lockdown because of the social and psychological consequences, for example, school closures um, would have. But what we see at the moment is that Merkel and her government wants to keep, especially the capitalist economy, running for profits. And that's why they're not doing enough at the moment to uh, prevent further infections and um, the spread uh, of the pandemic. So what you see at the moment in Germany is that they are mostly targeting individual behavior and free time activities, just like Virginie uh, said, workers are supposed to go to work and not do anything else. Pubs are, are, are closed late in uh, the evenings and uh, private gatherings are uh, restricted. But at the same time, for example, you have major outbreaks, for example, in uh, meat production, where you have uh, low pay and very bad uh, accommodation. Uh, at the moment, it's not clear how many infections you would have from uh, bad workplace uh, um, regulations, from the daily commuting uh, of uh, working people, from childcare and school facilities and so on. Also, we say that uh, refugee camps uh, should be evacuated uh, and, uh, and people put into separate apartments because you had some uh, virus um, clusters there. But what the government is just trying to do is um, to uh, give away all the responsibility for the situation at the moment and put it on the individual uh, behavior of, uh, of uh, working um, people. And uh, they want, don't want to take any general measures which could uh, limit um, their profit making. That's also in relation to some free time activity. So um, you have um, uh, a, the whole part of the tourism industry, uh, hotels, restaurants and so on, uh, which they try to keep open, especially some local governments try to uh, um, put things forward in, in the interest of their uh, local bosses. So what we say as a socialist organization Solidarity or uh, SOL, as we call ourselves, we say that restrictions are necessary, that the contacts of people must be reduced, but we say this must be done uh, in the way which is most effective against the pandemic and not what is most profitable for um, the capitalists. So we say that workplaces and services which are not directly necessary shall be closed down, that uh, small shops um, which have proven need um, needs uh, uh, financial um, support and pubs and 
that we need a democratic planning of how to reduce um, these uh, of contact, how to reduce um, also all the ways people are, uh, are meeting, and uh, that we also need um, democratic decision on it. For example, on the question of schools, we demand democratic discussion and decision of teachers, parents, and school students about whether to close or open schools um, at the moment. And we also say that we need massive extension of tests to make um, necessary meetings and events um, safe and to have free um, tests for everyone um, who needs it. And Tony, you said like Merkel would be uh, like strengthened at the moment. I think that is true uh, for the moment. I think some of the measures are seen by a majority of people as uh, necessary and that uh, at the moment the government seems a little bit to um, do what is what is necessary but i think a lot more and more people will see as it becomes more clear in what kind of interest their measures um, are also um, and uh, so we think that this is going to that this can change very quickly and that the support of this government um, might drop uh, very, very sharp in the in the future. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, Germany's obviously also been hit, Michael, hasn't it, by the economic crisis, but it's not been as badly hit as, for example, Spain or, uh, or the UK has at this stage. But nevertheless, you have seen a rise of unemployment. You're now seeing some protests taking place, I understand it, against the closure of steel plants and uh, some of the motor uh, car producing uh, plants as well. There's been some strikes that are not in the public sector and wage negotiations are taking place. So maybe you could outline what's happening a little bit on the trade union and industrial front, because that's obviously crucial. So already the crisis is really affecting large parts of, uh, of the industry. And we've seen uh, workers wanting to fight back uh, against that. So last weekend we had 3,000 steel workers demonstrated against the possible uh, selling out of the steel industry to an infamous British company called Liberty, Liberty Steel, which is infamous for their bad pay and working conditions, I think, in, in Eastern Europe uh, mostly. And we also had some important demonstrations in the motor industry. So uh, Continental, for example, they want to close some, uh, um, some factories. But what we see at the moment is that the trade union leadership is really holding back uh, resistance against it and that for example they limit um, uh, the participation on uh, demonstrations and they wrongly use the whole argument uh, of the pandemic uh, against participating in uh, in demonstrations so we also see that in the in the recent uh, round of wage negotiations in public services which uh, will affect 2.3 uh, million uh, million workers so the trade union leadership wanted to postpone these wage negotiations in the in the first place but the employers really wanted to see it through uh, and, and so these negotiations negotiations happen uh, this fall and their last offer last week was completely just a slap in the face of uh, of workers with very low uh, increase in um, in wages especially also for workers like in in the hospitals etc who had to bear the, the biggest part of the, uh, of the of the pandemic. So, but the, the trade union at the moment is really uh, limiting uh, limiting strikes. So I went to two pickets uh, uh, last week. And for example, on the first picket, uh, the trade union uh, leadership, um, they asked workers to come and sign that they participate in the strike, but then sent them home again. So there were no meetings, no manifestations, no demonstrations and so on. And in the other case, there was a, a demonstration of, of hospital workers. Uh, so they were coming together and, and going out. But at the same time, for example, bin workers were striking as well, but they weren't, weren't br uh, brought together. And uh, the trade union is making uh, one part on one strike on one day, the next uh, strike on the next day, um, uh, etc. Et and um, this is really bad for the mobilization. So we as Saul, we participate in the associations for combat combative unions and they demand that the negotiations should be cancelled. So to tell the bosses, we don't want to talk to you anymore under these uh, circumstances and that they should mobilize all workers together on, uh, on, on big strikes all on one day. And then if necessary on consecutive days, 
um, to, um, um, to strike for um, higher wages. And in general, we really see that the bosses want to put the burden of the crisis on our shoulders, and we say no. So we say uh, that we need to fight back for decent pay and uh, uh, in all services, that we have to fight for every job, nationalize the companies which want to lay off workers and put them in under democratic, democratic control and management. Yeah, well, that's very important. But I mean, what you're doing there is participating in the trade union opposition group, which is crucial. It's part of a, uh, a crucial element of the CWI's policy of building opposition groups in the trade unions to fight to transform them into combative organisations, which maybe we'll come on to discuss in a moment in a bit more detail. But you've had in Germany uh, quite sizable anti-lockdown protests take place. Uh, that started also here in the UK. You've had it in a few other countries as well. But you've got the, the developments uh, in Germany, have you not, of quite a widespread uh, support for the conspiracy theorists uh, who were there in different forms of different arrays. We've had features here related to QAnon, which is an American phenomenon which has become a bit more global. Uh, but what is the situation there in Germany? Because those protests have been quite sizable. And how have you reacted to that? So... Although the protests have been quite cyclic, I wouldn't really say that they had a lot of support here. So we've seen a whole number of mobilization uh, over the last um, uh, weeks of the so-called corona skeptics or uh, what have you. And the, the biggest protests were, I think, up to 20,000 people um, um, in Berlin. And on this demonstration, if you really had a look on it, uh, it were all sorts of Christian fundamentalists esoteric uh, people, esoteric organizations, uh, conspiracy theorists. I think this QAnon, they also spread um, here. And you also had uh, quite a large uh, participation of uh, fascists and also the far right, which uh, were tolerated and even to some degree welcomed by the organ organizers of these um, um, demonstrations um, here. And that was really a break of taboo seeing fascist flags flying high in the center of Berlin with thousands of people um, uh, around it um, um, here. And in the beginning of this protest, you even had some uh, left-wing, so self-proclaimed left-wingers who had no problems with teaming up with some uh, right-wing um, elements. So we as an organization, we took a hard stand on that and we demanded no support for these demonstrations and um, initiatives. And while their demonstrations were quite big and they were uh, really loud, they didn't have a lot of support in society as a whole and uh, among uh, workers. Nevertheless, I would say that uh, the left and trade unions really left a kind of an open flank for people who would not agree with the, uh, the measures of the government and especially the undemocratic character of the anti-pandemic legislation. So um, the government here took a lot of rights for them, um, took it away from parliament, et cetera, et cetera, had a lot of uh, new, um, new laws. And uh, I think if the, the left and the trade unions really would have had an independent working class program and opposition to the government um, policies, I think um, these lunatics wouldn't be able to attract so many people um, uh, on their, uh, on their um, demonstrations. And I think this is really needed, that we need a new uh, orientation, a real uh, working class program for the left and uh, the trade unions in that situation. Yeah, well, I mean, it, that's obviously uh, you know, part of the international issue. We've heard from Virginie about the question of uh, Francine Somi and uh, Mélenchon and his role. Now, of course, in Germany, we have the existence of the Linker, how has the linker faced up to this position, uh, politically, programmatically, in terms of offering an alternative? So, in my point of view, really, a big part of the leadership of Die Linke fails to grasp really what's the depth of this uh, crisis and the extent into which it's going to change the balance of classes um, uh, here. So, Many in Die Linke really just hope that the pandemic will go over and uh, they can go back to business uh, as, uh, as usual. And they were really incapable of forming a real opposition 
uh, a left opposition to the politics of Merkel and uh, her government. And also, uh, Die Linke is now participating in three different state governments in Germany. And really, in these states and in these um, uh, governments, they, they weren't any uh, any different from uh, any other bourgeois um, state governments or legislation, what they did um, uh, against the um, pandemic. So uh, this is a, a really uh, bad situation um, here. At the same time, we see at the moment that the right wing of the party wants to make the party ready for coalitionism. So we're going to have general elections in Germany uh, next, uh, next year. Merkel is not standing again. So it's very open, very politicized um, um, situation. And they were, some of the leaders of uh, Die Linke sp uh, spoke out and said that they want to water down the position on NATO, uh, arms exports, um, uh, etc. And that they already, they are adopting a more and more soft tone on the Social Democrats, on the Greens, which is also affecting the whole uh, way they are um, uh, dealing with the crisis um, and the pandemic. And we, we're going to see how this is all coming together at the party conference, which is taking place next week, um, where also we have the situation that the old two leaders of the party are not standing um, again. And most likely they're going to be replaced by one a former uh, Marx 21, which is SWP in, uh, in England and Wales, a supporter on the one hand, uh, Janine Wissler, and on the other hand, a really strong supporter of uh, coalitionism is from a state where the Linke is also uh, having the pr state prime uh, minister, uh, Susanne henning Belzo, And they're going to, to uh, take over um, the leadership um, of the party. So some left people hope that uh, the, this former or still uh, uh, SWP Marx 21 supporter is going to be more shift to the left or is a guarantee against coalitions. In, um, in Die Linke, but if you look at all her statements in the last weeks, like it's just the opposite, but it will mean that probably the party is going um, uh, more to uh, the right and it, or her statements are really leading in that um, direction. So we are, as Sol, we are part of Die Linke, we are members of the party and we call for an immediate change of politics in the party. And we really warn of the, the way the party is developing um, at the moment. And we say that we need the party as a genuine voice against the ruling establishment and uh, their parties, that they have to be active in the protest, in the resistance against foreclosure, in the resistance against cuts and the measures, um, the pandemic measures, which are in the interest of the rich. And we say that we need a fundamental socialist program and combative actions of um, the party. But really, how the leadership is positioning itself um, at the moment for the general elections next year, and the situation is uh, really a worrying one here. Well, thanks, Michael. I think that's given a very clear uh, explanation and, and illustration of what is, is process is unfolding in Germany in the course of the next period, which is, of course, the key powerhouse, economically at least, of Europe and crucial from the point of view of the European workers' struggles. Now, of course, also we've had in the course of the last week an intensification of the crisis in, uh, in the UK. We've had this incredible position uh, of a battle that's opened up between uh, Johnson and his government and the Labour mayor of Manchester, Andy Burnham. Uh, you've seen a major issue of division between North and South. You've now seen the government coming in and threatening all sorts of action against the London Labour mayor. And it really reveals a lot about the class uh, divisions that have opened up within UK society, doesn't it, Rob? Maybe you'd have a few comments to uh, amplify some of those points and explain a bit about the depth of the crisis which is facing the Johnson administration. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Thanks, everyone. I think absolutely what, what is clear is, is the scale of the crisis, but also what it shows is, is how uh, some of these figures can be pushed into opposition positions and that's what we've seen with uh, Andy Burnham, really, who, let's be clear, you know, uh, has happily served uh, as part of um, uh, the Blair, it's certainly the uh, Ed Miliband administrations in the Labour Party, um, stood against Jeremy Corbyn for the Labour leadership in 2015, became 
Mayor of Greater Manchester. Um, but of course, such is the scale of the crisis. He has become, you know, he has become, if you like, over the last few days, almost a symbol of opposition to Johnson and the uh, Tory government. And, um, but, as you know, the point that we make is, is that what he hasn't done uh, has been prepared to defy uh, Johnson, to have a programme to take Johnson on and to, gi to give a lead to, uh, to workers. What happened was, was that he, set, he uh, set a demand for Johnson's government that uh, in Greater Manchester they need an additional £90 million of the Tory government. Johnson was only prepared to give him £60 million. In our opinion, what he should then have done is said, uh, as the head of the Greater Manchester Authority, then he, he would borrow, which he can do, the £30 million, but then say to Johnson, I am going to organise and lead a mass movement with the trade unions of the working class communities uh, in Greater Manchester, uh, an area of a few million uh, people, and prepared to take on Johnson. That would have a massive effect. In fact, we'd have gone further because uh, the northwest of England, which includes Manchester, Liverpool, and other areas, parts of that have been put in the uh, tier three uh, level of restrictions because of the infection rate. That could, have, that could have been a mighty movement that in reality, in our opinion, would have defeated Johnson on this, uh, on this issue. But more than that, and this is the important issue, would have really put the stamp on events of the labour and trade union movement at this stage. And we still call for that. We still use that as a means to put forward our programme and our demands for, the, uh, for the, obviously the labour politicians, but also for the trade unions uh, as well. And I think that is the key issue. What, what is the role of the labour and trade union movement in this uh, events? And it's clear to me that what we've seen in Britain, probably like other countries, was when the pandemic first hit in March and April in particular, the Labour and trade union leaders capitulated to national unity. They succumbed to that pressure to lower the banner of the independent organisation uh, of, uh, of workers. Uh, and therefore, we've seen unions, which, which some of which have had a militant history, cancel disputes, uh, uh, stop strikes happening. We saw in the PCS union, the civil service union, where the leadership over the heads of the National Executive Committee parked, in their words, the full pay claim uh, of, that, uh, of that union. And therefore, for a f at the start of lockdown, we saw basically the, the stopping, really, of, uh, of any disputes. You look at the situation now, Tony, in, uh, in Britain. It's not like that at all. It's a low level, but we've seen a whole number of disputes uh, open up. Now, why is why, why the difference? Well, the trade union leaders, unlike the Labour leaders, certainly the likes of Starmer, the trade union leaders uh, do feel the pressure of the members. And of course, the members are seeing that there's no national unity in Britain. Workers are far more likely to, uh, to contact COVID and to die. Uh, certainly black and Asian workers are even more likely because of their poverty uh, in, that, uh, in that way. They've seen the hypocrisy of the Tories. They've seen the fact that Tory MPs and Tory advisors like Dominic Cummings can flout the COVID regulations and nothing happens to them. But they can also see that the COVID, uh, the pandemic has led uh, also to an attack on jobs, on terms and conditions. In Britain now, we have the phrase fire and re -hire. So workers in British Airways, British Gas also workers in the Labour Council of Tower Hamlets in London, but other employers using, uh, in effect, making workers redundant and employing them on worse terms and conditions. And therefore, workers are seeing that actually there is no national unity with the employers and the Tory government, and therefore they have to fight back. And that is starting to be reflected in a number of disputes. It was reflected in NHS workers, rank and file NHS workers, over the heads of their own trade unions, organising protests for a 15% pay rise as well. And of course, in my opinion, it was also reflected in the massive Black Lives Matter movement, where, you know, uh, young people in particular, but workers as well, from all backgrounds, seeing the class inequalities 
in society. Oh, well, I think that's a uh, key, Rob, in terms of that. And just maybe for our international viewers, just to uh, explain at one point why the issue with Manchester became so crucial is because under the government's tier three proposals, uh, they would only cover two thirds of the wages of those workers who are working in companies that will be compelled to shut down. And given under tier three, they're closing down bars, restaurants, uh, and other areas where they're mainly workers on the minimum wage. So it means you're cutting a third, 33% of the women minimum wage is being cut, which is a big factor for provoking such outrage. Now you touched on wealth there, obviously the question of increased polarization that's taken place. You mentioned a little bit about the trade unions, but how are they responding? I mean, today, uh, I understand they called the TUC and the employers' organisations in for a joint conclab uh, uh, with the government. How are the trade union leadership overall uh, facing up to the position? What are they doing? And more importantly, in a sense, what's happening in terms of building opposition within uh, the trade unions to some of the policies of the trade union leaders? Well, I think, Tony, that when I said earlier that there's been a certain change, at least, from the response of the trade unions in the second wave of COVID to the first wave, I think we'd have to say to many of the leaders, then left to their own devices, there wouldn't be a change. And we saw that when uh, the Chancellor, the Tory Chancellor Sunak, announced the replacement of the job retention scheme, the furlough scheme, where at that stage 80% of wages were covered. I make it clear. Our position is it should be work or full pay. If workers aren't uh, able to work or uh, their jobs are affected by COVID, in our opinion, 100% of their pay should be covered. And we argue that employers who shed labour or, or close or make redundancies should be taken into uh, public ownership. But when the Tories announced the replacement of the furlough scheme that runs out next week, um, and that scheme was a, was a really scaled down uh, version. It, it'd go from 80%, perhaps to two thirds, possibly uh, lower. Then when the to Tory Chancellor announced that, he had on one uh, shoulder the head of the Bosses uh, Association. Uh, and on the other hand, he had the leader of the TUC, the General Secretary of the TUC. If you wanted to know what national unity looks like in Britain, you saw it in Downing Street outside the office of the uh, of the chancellor but what i would stress is is that uh, the other trade union leaders are far more uh, far more uh, feel the pressure uh, of uh, of members but, but obviously they have to go much further and therefore that is reflected in certain unions and we have seen uh, some strikes starting to uh, take place um, and what is welcome, we saw in the last uh, um, few days a, bar, a strike ballot result announced in Lancashire, the Rolls-Royce plant, against the, potent, the threat and closure uh, of that uh, plant. We, have, we see oil tanker drivers again in the northwest of uh, England uh, announcing a whole series of days of, uh, of strike action. And we have to obviously support that. But it's certainly not the case that it's on the scale that it needs to be. And I, I, you know, what we argue uh, in the Socialist Party, but also in the National Shop Stewards Network, that we Socialist Party members uh, play an important role in, is we have to make the point is, is that it's not impossible to fight in this period. It's just the methods and the programme and demands put forward by the trade unions have to be on a far higher level than uh, before, the, uh, pan, the, uh, before the pandemic. And, and what that means is, is we have to, if you like, raise the uh, idea that if employers want to close uh, workplaces or factories, we have to raise the idea that workers have to look to occupy those uh, uh, factories. As I said, we have to look at taking uh, uh, workplaces into public ownership uh, as well. But there's also important elections uh, taking place, not least in Unison, the biggest public sector union uh, in the UK, over a million public sector workers, and our member, Hugo Pierre, is standing in that uh, uh, election. That is a union that has had, uh, a right-wing uh, leadership, a leadership that, in our opinion, is responsible for the stopping uh, of the public sector pension dispute in 2011, when two million workers took uh, strike action. 
if that union was led by someone like uh, Hugo Pierre with the uh, rank and file members uh, uh, organised, then that would totally change the situation uh, in, uh, in Britain. A union with a militant, we believe, a lead given could be a militant uh, union uh, taking action uh, as well. And we make the point, it's not that workers in Britain uh, don't want to fight. Where a lead has been given, then they have been prepared to fight, and that includes during the pandemic as well. OK, well, thanks, sir, Rob. And just finally, because there's obviously been a change in the situation uh, since Corbyn, as you referred to earlier, I mean, you now have Keir Starmer uh, as the leader of the Labour Party, that shifted uh, the party quite decisively to the right. But what's happening there vis-à-vis -vis the Labour Party at the present time? Is it beginning to challenge Johnson as Labour's support increased? But what programme is it based on? Well, in our opinion, the victory of Starmer is a decisive defeat uh, of Corbynism, of the left uh, in the Labour Party. Of course, that doesn't mean that we are not prepared to work with those uh, genuine uh, members and activists who want to fight for a left political vehicle in, uh, in Britain. But in reality, Starmer is trying to prove himself to be a reliable tool of the capitalist establishment in Britain. We've seen that just over the last uh, week, really, where he wanted, well, he, he uh, really ordered his MPs to um, abstain on the new bill. In reality, a sp you know, a spying bill of the, uh, of the, uh, of the establishment uh, in Britain. Uh, an establishment, by the way, that we ourselves have been victims of, uh, of spying by the state Against, uh, against ourselves, but also blacklisted trade unionists, campaigners, anti-racist campaigners, etc., etc. You know, we have no confidence in the state. And yes, and yet, unfortunately, Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, has uh, faith. That was, a, that was a, uh, him trying to prove to them that he's not like Jeremy Corbyn. He's, a reliable, uh, he's reliable for the capitalist establishment. We make this point, by the way, that Jeremy Corbyn... Um, the, the problem for the, for the capitalists in Britain was, was that they were concerned that Corbyn would raise the hopes and expectations of workers if he was elected. Certainly on the programme he put forward in 2017 and in 2019. And you imagine the fear the establishment would have in Britain in the, in the crisis we have now, if, an, if someone like Corbyn, who's unreliable, they couldn't trust him, uh, was leading the Labour Party at this stage. That's why they moved might and main to get someone like uh, Keir Starmer as leader of the, uh, of the Labour Party. And in reality, uh, you know, again, uh, contrasting with Burnham in a way, Burnham is, is in reality reflecting the pressure and the anger of workers in Greater Manchester and of course throughout the North West, but also workers throughout uh, the UK uh, as well. Whereas Starmer actually is, um, is, is what we would call in British terms, a, a second 11, is, a, is, somewhat, is a, to be used, if you like, should the Johnson government pro prove totally unacceptable for them, totally that uh, they can't go on with him, then they see Starmer as reliable to be used in that direction. And that's why, for the Socialist Party, we say, both generally, but also in the, particularly in the trade unions, there now has to be a discussion about what is the political vehicle the working class people can build to represent them uh, at, this, uh, at this stage. And that doesn't mean, by the way, we cut off people who at this stage see that struggle uh, in the Labour Party, but we feel that discussion is open. And therefore, you know, the trade unionist and so socialist coalition, which was in reality put in abeyance during the Corbyn years, we give critical support to Jeremy Corbyn's leadership left leadership of the uh, Labour Party, but uh, the Trade Union and Socialist Coalition, Tusk, has now been really revived. The RMT National Executive Committee has agreed for that to be uh, revived for discussions to, to begin. There's elections on in the UK uh, next May, important elections, including in London, but other places uh, as well. And we think that discussion is out there that needs to happen throughout the Labour uh, and trade union movements that we have, in contrast to Starmer, 
a anti uh, cuts anti austerity alternative that can be put forward and is absolutely necessary that needs that needs to be put forward right now uh, during the pandemic and also the attacks on jobs terms and conditions the workers are facing okay well thanks rob and thanks virginie and michael uh, from paris and uh, berlin respectively i think they've given a very good airing all three of you to some of the trends that are taking place in europe in three key countries and we'd appeal to our viewers to uh, check out more of our analysis on our website that's the committee for workers international website at socialistworld.net you can follow us on twitter at cwi socialist you can like our facebook page on socialist world cwi or you can follow us on instagram at socialist world and in particular we'd appeal to you to join our youtube channel and subscribe to that you don't have to pay for it although it says subscribe just tick the box it helps us uh, boost our uh, uh, our audiences and our ratings on the social media and we'd appeal to you in the meantime don't just be passive get actively involved read our analysis go on our website we need your financial support and above all we need you to join us and assist with us in building a real socialist alternative in the three countries you've heard from today and of course globally and internationally and if you contact us at our website then we'll put you in touch with uh, uh, our comrades who are actively fighting to build a socialist alternative. Today we've covered Europe and for the next two broadcasts because of the crucial importance of developments in the US we'll be featuring developments in the US firstly in the final uh, days of the US presidential elections and then we'll be having a special broadcast after that dealing with an analysis uh, of those presidential elections and what we can expect to flow from them. So thanks for watching once again join us in the CWI in the struggle for a socialist world and in the meantime stay safe and keep on struggling.